Now we're going to turn abroad and look at U.S. exports and what's happening in the international market to look at some of the, uh, you know, piece together the global uh, flows of refined products, oil demand, you know, what does that look like as we head into the new year? So, you know, just kicking it off before we get there, you know, please like, share, subscribe. You know, we've appreciated your support all throughout the uh, the year. You know, we've done a, you guys have helped us uh, grow. So we, we truly appreciate it. And uh, and hopefully we're, we're in for a, a solid 2021. So as we look at U.S. products, um, gasoline had a nice, in, a nice increase of 154,000 barrels. Uh, it's, it's a little bit higher than we were expecting, but kind of stable in terms of that direction, uh, in terms of the increase. Uh, distillate had a small increase of 29,000 barrels. We thought it was going to dip a little bit, but again, some of that timing. Uh, LPG had a nice increase of 133,000 barrels, which is uh, you know something that we were expecting, just given the demand and the pricing into the international market. You know, the one that surprised us was uh, crude exports, and and it wasn't so much the the, the surprise to the upside is just the amount. It was up 526,000 barrels a day. Big push to get product in, uh, you know, oil into the market, reduce it out of, uh, you know, storage, reduce some of that tax bill as we head into the new year. So again, these are things that will start to normalize. You know, we normally get an increase into year end. I just didn't think it was going to be at this level. You know, again, Alaska, you know, Pat three continues to be fair, uh, very strong. And it's it's just going to be a matter of where do we sit going into into uh, next year. And you can see year over year, it's down eight hundred thirty seven thousand barrels versus last year, but it's up one point seven versus the five year average, which isn't surprising given uh, you know we didn't really have a very robust export market for our crude until at least twenty seventeen, which is something that we're going to show in a few slides. But again, year over year, the direction is going in where it was last year. It's obviously not as high as it was last year as we got up to over 4 million. And this will be the timing delays. We should see a fairly robust um, continuation this this week into next week, and then it'll start to drop off. But you know whether that that reduction gets us to 3.3 or three. I, I, you're right. Right now, there's a lot of boats sitting around. It's kind of hard to get a, 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 a tell for us. But again, it, it'll still remain within that. Uh, you know, either just below three million or just over that three million mark. Uh, this is looking at the the, uh, the the gasoline exports. You can see based on the top of the cloud, based on the average, we normally get a spike into year end. Uh, it's just going to be a matter of you know where do we sit, and just based on what we're seeing, you know Brazil had a little bit of a reduction uh, month over month on refinery throughput. Gasoline demand remains fairly stable into some of our markets, which will be good for the um, for some of our exports into Latin America. The biggest issue is going to be where does European product go. As we continue to see some some uh, adjustments from not only again more lockdowns in the UK, other parts of Europe, some extensions into uh, into Q1, you know these are things that are going to weigh on gasoline demand, which is going to slate more to go into the export market, and we do have uh, some flows coming from the Middle East, and it's just going to be a matter of where does that product kind of land. It'll be competition for the U.S., but it, it, it's not going it, to. It doesn't mean that we're going to fall below that nine-year average. We're just going to we're going to continue to be fairly lumpy, but it will stay above the nine-year average, just given the demand that we're seeing in Latin America so far. Now, when we look at uh, distillate, you know, our expectation was to see a drop off and and follow the average. And if you look at the top of the cloud, bottom of the cloud, average, we normally kind of get this drop off into year end. Instead, it was you know fairly flat, which is a positive to see. But at the same time, it's something where just on the other on the flip side, a lot of our disty goes into Europe, and when just given this redirection where we we were supposed to see some Asian Middle Eastern flow going into uh, Europe, it's actually gotten redirected. There was a VLCC that was initially signaling Rotterdam. It's now going to West Africa. So that just it just kind of points to the, an issue in terms of where is our product going to go. And without Europe really taking it, we're going to kind of kick off the year below that that nine year average, which again is just going to kind of uh, persist as we head through uh, through January. Now here's where we're looking at, uh, you know, U.S. crude exports. You can see that we had this this sizable bounce, and uh, when we compare it to 2019, very similar in terms of the direction. Now, as we head into the beginning of uh, of January, you can see that they, they they typically start at a lower point. As we get this last surge, 
then things uh, normalize. The question is, is, is it going to be this week or next week, depending on uh, the timing of not only Christmas, but then New Year's. So there could be a nice push to get things out before ahead of the new year. And then things start to slow down as we get through January. And you can see that they're, they're fairly lumpy. But, you know, just based on the demand we're seeing, we think it's going to be closer to kind of the, uh, let's call it 2.6 to 2.8, as we do have uh, buyers from Europe at about 900,000 barrels a day, buyers from Asia at about 950,000 barrels a day. So we have support. The question is, are we going to get to, you know, based on what we're seeing, we think 2.5 to about 2.8 is going to be a, a comfortable range through January, unless we get some bigger discounts, you know, because right now, when we look at Brent versus LLS, there's only about a $1.15, uh, di- uh, you know, differential. And th- we're going to have to see that widen a bit to get some of our LLS into the market again, which is going to weigh on, on exports, but again, put us closer to the start of the year at about that 2.6 to 2.8 million. Now propane with the new facility, again, a uh, <laughs> nice surge to the upside, you know, finishing off the year strong, you know, given the fact that we now have new capacity, things will, will definitely look uh, and start at a much higher level. And now mind you, this is also happening with, problems within the uh, the Panama Canal. So as some of those issues start to clear, we'll see uh, uh, even more exports coming from the US or at least, you know, stabilizing at a very high level. So we're going to continue to make, you know, new seasonally adjusted all-time highs, but it's just because we have more actual physical capacity to get into the market and just based on the demand that we continue to see in Asia, in Europe, you know, we're, there's a lot of strength uh, year over year in terms of demand. There was a quick rebound and we don't see that stopping. So that's going to be very supportive for LPG heading from the U.S. and into uh, and into uh, not only Europe, but more, more specifically into Asia. Uh, crude oil and transit, you know, as we've been saying, there's there is a, a big increase in terms of uh, crude oil and transit. As there normally is this time of year, it, the slope has accelerated, and so it's getting us closer to 2017 levels. But again, it, it's still going to take time. A total of 10 VLCs carrying about 20 million barrels of North Sea crude have left Europe, uh, heading into Asia. You know, and this is something that we continue to follow. And as we've been saying, as stuff is going from uh, storage, you know, because you have to be stationary for seven days, as it's going from storage, it's now moving into transit, and then it'll show up as storage on the receiving end, which for the, for this specific, uh, you know, 20 million barrels will be Asia. It'll just be a matter of timing as of when does it get there. And now as we look at oil in transit, you can, you know, we have to go to January and look at, okay, well, where is January normally? So we'll start out the year something closer to 2018, 2019, uh, I should say 2018 uh, levels. And then it should accelerate overall as as we, we do have some support out of Asia as we get stuff moving from one point, uh, one port to the other. And this is going to be something to watch to see, okay, well, how quickly do we get up there, especially with the OPEC agreement adjusting in January, putting an additional 500,000 barrels. I mean, less than that, just given the cheating, but you know, you, you, we, we will see some stable, uh, you're not going to have to hide those barrels, which just means that we'll, we should see it more uh, clearly in the data, if you will. And now when we look at crude, uh, crude oil in the water, we're now back above 2017 levels as we spike higher, just because we have an increase in not only floating storage, but oil in transit. So that's just putting just, a, a, just in aggregate more oil on the water itself, you know, especially as we get that transit side. Now, when we look at crude oil floating storage, you know, we had a, a, a spike. We're still below 2016 levels, but again, we're, we're still increasing into... Uh, into the end of the year. And if you just look, you know, uh, through some of the other uh, periods, we normally get an increase this time of year. And then if we look into into the beginning of January, you know, we're going to start at an elevated level just because a lot of this crude will show up in uh in, in Asia. And then we have the Lunar New Year to contend with. We have some of these slowdowns as we've seen some walkbacks in refinery throughput within China, which again is going to put more crude uh, uh, on the coast overall. You know, when we talk about what we're, we're seeing and kind of expecting, you know, we can look at Russia in, in itself and you can see that that is the increase in, 
in uh, in total throughput based on the OPEC agreement. So we have a, a big increase of by about let's call it three hundred thousand barrels a day hitting the water from Russia, which is why we're seeing some of the pricing pressure in the physical market as we have an additional uh, amount to be to be settled. Norway, it, we're setting some records and now we have a little, little bit of a pairback. But again, you can see that we're still well above where we have been by about 100,000 barrels through the end of uh, end of 2020 as they have let their cuts expire. So we will see some stable growth there. Angola is going to hang around that 1.13, 1.17. Uh, Nigeria is going to be at about 1.4. So again, the the one to watch right now is going to be Russia, and it's going to be Libya because you can see Libya. You know, we're expecting to get to about uh, back over a million. You know, not everyone has reported, but you see that not everyone has reported for Libya, but we're already for January over 10 million barrels into the open water. We will cross over and get to about 10.3. And again, that's why we're seeing more oil on the water, more oil in storage, which is just going to kind of you know put that pressure on uh, on some of the physical pricing. And this just gives you some some con- puts into context just how sharp the bounce off the bottom has been for Russia. You know, this is one where we're we're not going to get quite to three point five on the water, but we will get to about three point four just based on the increase in euros that's being put into the market. Which And then this comes back to pricing. This is why we're seeing contango increase. We had a spike into backwardation, and now we're seeing this fall back on, uh, on Brent prompt, uh, time spread coming back into a contango. Again, as there's just more physical and we're seeing more and more price cuts. Uh, Chevron cut its offer uh, for Pennington crude, but failed to find a buyer even at a reduced price. This is These are, I, I've given that's just one example, but we're seeing that more and more where we're seeing uh, some price reductions. You know, we had a, a, you know, as we talked about it at the, in the first seven days of December, we saw some big increases. And now by the, by let's call it the fourth, you know, the 13th or 14th, we saw all of those price increases go away. And we actually started to see discounts against OSPs. And, you know, they were either at parity or discounted OSPs after being anywhere from 50 cents to $1.50 above OSP. And, and again, that, that's the timing that we've been talking about with when does Asia buy, when does China buy, and that's why we're starting to see some of this disconnect, and, and you know, the, uh, the uh, time spreads are starting to pick that up. Now, when we look at overall uh, refining margins, so Northwest, e, uh, Northwest Europe, sweet cracking margin is at $0, sweet hydro skimming margin is negative $1, sour cracking margins at a buck, uh, sour hydro skimming margins at 50 cents, Singapore cracking margin is at $1, Again, and this is this is just cracking. This isn't storage. Uh, so you're seeing that even even with some of the these views on on crack spreads, uh, crack spreads are either negative or just barely positive, which again is just putting these huge headwinds into how are refiners really going to ramp in this market? And here's just you you see a lot of consolidation. This is just looking at Singapore uh, specifically had a little bit of a spike, but when we look at this uh, end of December, we normally see a spike. And as we go through the last five years, we normally get some of this increase into December. The question is going to be, where do we sit going into January? And, and, and here is where, if you look at 2019, how that kind of broke apart. Again, coming to why we were you know, getting so bearish in 2019. You know, here, we're not going to see the same type of collapse, but just because obviously refinery run rates are very different levels. Where in 2019 we were much closer to seasonal norms, which is putting which was putting so much pressure on demand. We also had you know things happening in China with the the rise of COVID within China itself, the lockdowns there, which again put pressure through March. But we're still not seeing a, a normalization in Singapore, which is just kind of pointing to this this oversupply that remains, which is just going to be that headwind on on just overall um, uh, overall throughput. And this is just looking at hydro cracking refiner margins again. Where uh, this is that seasonally adjusted that we continue to talk about. Where seasonally adjusted, we're, we're still better than 19, but again, 19 was a really bad year, and uh, I should say the end of 19 was a really bad year. So we're still well off of where we should be on the average, which is that blue line, which is about a let's call it 375. Instead, we're at you know a dollar. And, and we, in, in 2019, we're at negative 66 cents. So 
that's why as we as we start the year, you know, we're going to start well off of where we should be. Where it won't be as bad as 2020, obviously because of the issues that we have with China. But it's not going to be anywhere near the average, which is just going to keep a headwind on refinery throughput, which is we even with at these reduced levels of refinery throughput, we still have massive storage levels because you would assume with refiners running at this level, you would start to see the, the drawdown of product. And we're just not seeing that correlation because that end user demand remains a problem. You know, uh, Fajara is just one example where oil product inventories at the UAE port uh, there was a small draw of 53,000 barrels. Again, that's just 0.2% versus where we were. But it, it, there, there was different weighting. So the positives were that we had a drawdown in middle distillate. So that is the overarching positive was the reduction was 8.2%. That's a, that, you know, we've been talking about how that is a good indicator for kind of some of these movements. But now we have to break that into pieces. So light distillate saw an increase of 4.2%, which is is a bigger problem because, again, that's the end. The, the consumer overall still remains weak, still not seeing that pull through. Middle distillate inventories, which includes the jet fuel and diesel, that fell 449,000 barrels or 8.2%. But the gas oil market is, is is the one where it's the diesel side was positive, but gas oil was a problem because the gas oil market, which is let's just break it east and west Suez. So east of Suez was is seeing a lot of downward pressure due to the European demand concerns that we've talked about, which again is is is, is putting a, it's going to put pressure on U.S. exports. But the you know just using the UK as an example, the tighter strains uh, are are becoming a, a problem, and which has created the issue with um, the arbitrage economics, which has again diverted the barrels of, from Asia and the Middle East westward. So instead of them coming into Europe, they're kind of stuck, and they're either in West Africa, they're either in the Middle East, which again is is why we keep talking about all this product that's kind of just sloshing around and has to find a home and it just it just continues to float from port to port without any real place to uh to to sit and then stocks of heavy distillate uh rose about one percent and again it's including uh, fuel for power bunker and and the thing is you know traders when as uh, this is a comment from s p global a trader said bunker activity in fujaro was slowing to a trickle with many buyers having already secured their supplies for the holiday period and suppliers covering their books for the fin- the end of the financial year so again this is seasonally normal in terms of people kind of close down for the year and then they start to get back to normal the question is what does normal look like and just based on the amount of products sitting in storage it just won't be as robust as it normally is and it's going to continue to weigh on not only crack spreads but also oil demand and refined product demand now this is looking at things a little differently looking at worldwide crude floating storage you can see that we did get a big increase uh, you know, but we normally get an increase this time of year, but you can see that this is putting us back to where we were at the beginning of December. The amount of crude oil held around the world on tankers uh, that have uh, stationary for seven days, it's back over 100 million barrels. It's back to 100.5. Uh, that's up 25%. Uh, that's, that's up, you know, and then let's look it up. So now that's up about 25%. Uh, from December 18th, which was at 80 million barrels. So again, we got a, an increase of 25%. And it was really driven by a, a lot of different locations with everything showing an increase. Uh, Asia was up 26%. Europe was down 16%. Remember, you know, things moving from Europe, North Sea into uh, into Asia, as we talked about. And that's that's where we saw a decrease of, refi- of uh, floating storage, an increase in oil and transit as 20 million barrels headed into uh, into is heading to Asia. Middle East is up 100%. North Sea is up 4.8%. Again, just a matter of where was the oil being pulled from. U.S. Gulf is up 513%. Sounds like a lot, but again, when you're coming from zero, any increase is going to be a big increase. So it's better to talk about we went from zero barrels in storage to 2.7 million barrels in storage to give you an idea of that, uh, that, that, um, that increase. And then West Africa is up 8.8%. So when we look at super tanker crudes going into your, into Asia, uh, we're, we're back to seasonally adjusted um, all time highs of China's of uh, super tankers heading into into China, and and I say that you it, it's it's a seasonally adjusted, but it's in the same direction. And when we look at 2018, it it happened a, a week later. 
when we look at, you know, uh, 2017, when we look at just every single period, we see an increase. So seasonally adjusted, it's at an all time, but again, it's just a timing thing. So with the slope is the same, there's the same increase that we normally get. So there's really nothing surprising in terms of the amount of crude heading into Asia at this moment. It just happened a little bit earlier, which is all due to timing, you know, who's front running who. So it's just a timing component. But the question is going to be, where do we start to normalize? Because when you look at January, we normally see a big drop off. The question is going to be, how does Lunar New Year fall? Where do, where do some of these purchases happen? When do they slow down? So you can see 2019 started, started with a bang, then dropped off hard into February. We think it's going to be fairly similar to 2019, just given the Lunar New Year in February. So this is going to be something to watch as to also when does it sit in storage. Uh, the average run rates of the four state-owned oil uh, majors, they slipped in December. Uh, so they stood at around 78% versus 80% in November, which is what we've been hearing and talking about. Uh, PetroChina's average utilization fell to 69% from 73% in November as we had some maintenance shutdowns, as we had some uh, some reductions in order to allow some plants to increase. That's really not all that surprising overall. So then when we look at uh, when we look at Sinopec, though they've they maintain about 82%, and then when we look at some of the capacity at the teapots, they are at about 71%. So again, not not nothing too crazy, but seeing some of that walk back just as demands you know slows within the U.S. I, I'm sorry, within China, and also the export market really remains saturated, which has limited some of their export markets. Uh, just just to talk about some of the. Um, the export allowances. So the first batch came out. So the the China issues um, export uh, al- uh, allowances, which is up five percent year over year. Uh, China will allow five percent more oil product exports by state-owned and private companies in its first batch of quotas. So what does that mean? Twenty nine point five million tons of oil product export quotas were issued, which is up five point three six percent versus the first batch in twenty twenty. Again, there's just more. There's, there's just more throughput because you have new, new facilities turning on and that's being allocated appropriately to try to get some of that additional um, uh, product into the market. Uh, quotas under general trade, you know, we, we have the breakdown. We can send it to you. It, we don't, we, there's no real need to go through the different backdrops in terms of who got what, but you get an idea that there is an increase in quotas overall. Now, when we look at some of the exports, uh, as we as we discussed, you know, this is just looking at Chinese uh, gasoline exports. They're still a, they're still at at near all time highs. Uh, it's below 2019, but again, 2019 was was a, a market where by December they knew that they were facing some sort of issue. You had some of this uh, drop down, so you had exports increasing. Here we still are below 2019, but we're still well above uh, the uh, pretty much any other year. Again, but the, the issue remains, there's a lot of product and there's more utilization coming online, which is why we're seeing some of those reductions in utilization rates to make room, which is going to cap some of that oil demand that we've been talking about as you know some of that buying is going to slow down into China. Then when we look at diesel exports, uh, you can see that we had a spike. It happened ahead of schedule. We're now back below essentially 2017 and 2019, but when you look at it on the aggregate, we're still uh, at, I oh, should say, near those all-time highs. Uh, and just based on the demand that we're seeing in China, we should see this continue down a little bit. But again, we're seeing some, but then at the same time, we're seeing an increase in exports for some of the state-owned enterprises because a lot of the teapots have already maximized their export quotas, which is why we're going to see an additional slowdown. The state side should be able to offset that, but this will uh, just kind of showing you that they're they're still maintaining a fairly healthy diesel export. India, on the other hand, as we've talked about, uh, they're They've increased refinery throughput at the refiners that sell internally and decreased refinery throughput that are that go into the export market because the export market remains crowded. Here you can see gasoline exports setting a new uh, seasonally adjusted all time low. And, uh, you know, it's it's a little bit off the bottom. But again, it's it's still going to remain very soft, just given the, the pressure that we're seeing in the market on the gasoline side, as we talked about with Fujara and other locations. Uh, diesel exports are pretty are kind of hugging the the 10 year average. 
uh, just based on the the slowing demand within India, the you know the the, the issues that we're seeing abroad, and the reduced um, refinery throughputs. There's nothing to say that the ref, that diesel exports won't just continue to hug this 10 year average. Now, when we look at you know the the storage overall, this this kind of puts into context the spikes that we're seeing into Asian floating storage. We're getting back up into these numbers. You know, and it's it'll continue to trend higher just because South Korea remains low, China remains uh, you know flattish as you, they have more deliveries that are going to start showing up. India, same thing. Japan has seen a little bit of a, of a pull through, but it won't be enough to offset some of the additional capacity showing up. North Sea flat. Um, you know, there's nothing to say that it's really going to drop up or down. It's going to continue to see some of that increase, especially as we have Norway and other North Sea uh, components, you know, increasing total uh, loadings. Uh, West Africa, it, this is this was a positive when we saw the drop down, but now as we see some of the pressure overall, this is going to start moving much closer to the five year average. As you look at January, we typically see an increase. So th- again, there's nothing to say that we're not. We're just going to follow kind of that four or five year average. Middle East is starting to see an increase. This is something that we think is going to continue to increase as we have uh, an adjustment. You know, I, I, Iraq has increased um, throughput. Saudi Arabia, same thing. I, I, I'm sure, I should say oil production, again, ahead of the increase in the, the OPEC quotas. So nothing crazy to see, but we will get much closer to the average overall, even uh, obviously when we look at January, you know, the averages are a little bit lower just because 2016, 2017 were, were those really kind of ugly years when they had the the different fighting on price. So it, it's just, it's going to fall uh, elevated. It's, you know, below that five-year average at about, let's call it, a you know, a million, uh, I should say 10 million. It'll be something closer to, you know, eight eight or nine, just given the increases that we're seeing so far. Europe still remains above the average, even with um, shipments heading out. Uh, this is something where it's going to remain above average, but you know, again, still within the uh, the cloud overall. Then when we look at gas at, uh, at, at, at um, gasoline in Europe, this will be updated tomorrow, but you're seeing here that, you know, gasoline remains at a seasonally adjusted all-time highs, and this is even with a reduction of about six, uh, 66,000 tons. Uh, week over week, it's it, again, it's just going to be fairly elevated. And we normally see a spike, but again, we're going to start off the year at near or uh, either near or, or above uh, all time highs. Gas oil is is something similar where we're still well above the uh, the ten year average. Uh, I should say fifteen year average, but it's it it's following its normal trend. The problem is just given the issues in Europe. We're going to start off the year fairly elevated. And then how quickly do we come back from COVID, from the increases, from the lockdowns will kind of dictate how quickly we can kind of draw this down as we already have cargoes being turned away and being turned away. But when now when we look at Singapore, you know, as we said last week, we thought we were going to follow the normal seasonal dip, but it was just going to be at, at all time highs. And here you can see we're closing out the year. Either, uh, you know, it's right at all time, seasonally adjusted all time highs, uh, being driven pretty much across the board with increases everywhere. Uh, the biggest one that we continue to talk, uh, talk about is middle distillate. You can see middle distillate didn't have the drop off it normally has. And if you look at the average, you know, the top of the cloud, bottom of the cloud, we normally see a big drop off. Instead, we had a, a reduction, but just nothing near what it is. So we're going to start off the year, uh, you know, right at those all-time highs. Uh, gasoline had, a, uh, and I should say, light distillates had a, had a surge into the close into the close of the year as it normally does when we look at the top of the cloud. But it just gives you an idea that we're going to start off the year at these elevated levels. Uh, this is looking at Shandong Independent Refiners. Again, this is showing 75%. It just hasn't really updated. They're down to about 71%. Still, even at 71%, they're still at seasonally adjusted all-time highs, which is, um, again, some of that throughput that we're continuing to see coming off the coast. Uh, refinery storage at the um, uh, at the teapot level, they're back within the components. Uh, you know, They're sitting there at about 4. Let's call it 4.3 million. Uh, nothing crazy back within the uh, the levels. You know, obviously we're not back off those all time highs, but we're going to start off the year elevated even against 2020 levels. Uh, fuel oil stocks 
remain elevated. We're, you know, we're right back above the clouds. So we're kind of putting ourselves right there. China is, you know, going to see some of those issues and we're going to, they're going to start off the year at a, at a, a new seasonally adjusted all time highs. Again, this is going to be a matter of when do we see some of that pull through? Obviously, there's some prep work that's done ahead of Lunar New Year. As you can see, this big spike that normally happens in Feb, uh, end of January, beginning of Feb, not too surprising there. So there's there's a lot of moving parts. There's some bullish sides. There's some bearish sides, which is why we continue to be in this range bound with without any real driver to the upside. You know, I, I mean, the only driver to the upside has really been the dollar at this point and some of these offsetting components. But this is uh, things that we're going to continue to watch. You know, we hope you have a happy new year. Uh, we have the Frack Spread show coming out today. We have the Econ show coming out tomorrow. We'll film it today. The Econ show will be shorter. It'll be just two segments uh, about, you know, let's call it 36 slides or so. So, you know, <laughs> giving you a, a little less to watch uh, and try to summarize things a bit into the new year. And uh, hopefully uh, wishing everyone there, hopefully everyone had a happy holidays and a happy new year. So thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. Mm-hmm.